Hello and welcome to Mission Church. I'm Pastor Kyle, and we are so excited to have you join us. This has been a, such a privilege and honor to study the book of Ephesians together. And we've been in this series for 11 weeks. Today we're going to wrap it up with our final message in this series. And I want to encourage you. I hope this book has been a blessing to you and has really been a, an encouragement and a challenge. Last week, we left off by talking about the fact that we're in a spiritual battle, that this battle is raging all around us, and it's not a physical battle with tanks and missiles and swords and guns, but it's a spiritual battle in a spiritual realm. And even though we can't see it or touch it or connect to it, in a physical sense, it is very present around us and it impacts many areas of our lives. Now, as we talked about this battle, we, we sort of left off with one of the main instructions that we were given, and that was to put on the full armor of God. In fact, two different times, Paul encourages us in Ephesians 6 to put on the armor of God. This is how we stand firm in the, in the battle against the enemy. And it's interesting to me, as, as Paul was writing this letter, it's, it's commonly held that, that this is a prison epistle, that he was writing this from a Roman prison, and that every single day Paul would have had in front of him Roman soldiers, and he would have watched them and studied them and, and, and observed them, and they, they were just a very present part of the culture at this time. And, and as he's talking about how Christians, how believers in Jesus can fight a spiritual battle, he's got this sort of living illustration that's playing out every day in front of him because these soldiers are, are walking there and, and, and present in his life every single day. And, and so what Paul decides to do as he's writing this letter to Ephesians is really to use this as a great illustration, right? Great communicators use illustrations as they share their points to make them more powerful and effective. And so Paul latches on to this illustration of a Roman soldier, and he says, I can take some of the pieces of the armor and some of the outfit of the soldier and really relate that to the way a Christian can prepare and arm themselves for this spiritual battle. And so in Ephesians 6, we have sort of this description of, of what that would look like. He says, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So Paul just sort of, paints his picture using this living illustration of a Roman soldier and sharing about parts of his outfit and how they relate to this spiritual battle. So we want to take a few moments on each of these and just talk about what does this mean for a Christian, especially today because we don't relate to armor the same way that they may have at this day and time, and talk about what does it mean for us to understand the battle that rages and how we equip ourselves. Paul begins with the belt of truth. The Roman soldier would have worn a large leather belt around his waist, probably six inches uh, in, in width, and, and, and this would provide strength to his core, and, and, and this was kind of like the picture of what we would see as a weightlifter wearing this belt when he's going to deadlift or squat a, a heavy amount of weight. This would provide strength to the soldier's whole core. And, and why would Paul start with this area of truth? Why would he say that you need this belt of truth? Because in the spiritual battle, one of Satan's primary weapons is to deceive. We saw last week that Satan is a murderer and a liar. This is his nature and his character. John 8, says, He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. One of Satan's schemes is, is to attack the truth. We talked about the battlegrounds for this spiritual battle last week and the battle for truth in our culture. And, and Satan wants to come against believers and against the church to deceive us, to cause us to believe and even live out lies. There's a temptation that many of us have to believe lies. The enemy would tell us lies like this. He would say things like, you're not good enough. You're not worthy You've sinned too much. You've gone too far. 
for the grace of God. God has given up on you. God could never love you, right? These are lies that the enemy tries to tell us to cause us to look inward instead of remembering the truth of God about who we are in Christ. Remember that the beginning of Ephesians is all about our identity in Christ. If you, if you need a reminder, go back and read chapters 1 and 2 because Paul talks about this amazing transformation that we have experienced and, and how as Christians we've been redeemed and forgiven and, and, and blessed and how we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and, and the list goes on and on and on. And, and so when Satan tempts us to believe a lie, we need to arm ourselves with the truth. Not only does he tempt us to believe lies, but there's also a temptation to live out a lie. Sometimes we lie and deceive at work in order to close a sale, in order to get a new client, in order to make our quota, in order to pacify a demanding boss, or to put off a critical coworker. Sometimes we lie at home in order to cover our tracks, to avoid that phone call, to get out of doing something, to avoid an argument. Sometimes we lie to our wife or to our kids. Satan may try to get you to lie about your age, your resume, who did your homework, where you went, who you were with, how long you were out, and what you did. Satan tempts us to lie, and lies have the power to drag us into darkness, and that's why Paul says we need to arm ourselves with the truth. How do we defeat the lies of Satan? We defeat them with the belt of truth, with the truth of God's word. And so as we think about this spiritual battle, one of the most powerful and effective tools that we have is the Word of God. We have the, the Bible that gives us the truth of God's Word. This whole year we've been focused on reading the Word of God together, on preaching through books of the Bible and, and really being grounded in Scripture so that we can know and understand God's Word because this is the tool that we have to fight against the lies of the enemy, to believe these lies and to live these lies. Romans 12, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says, how are we transformed? We're transformed in our mind, in our thinking. We're transformed by the truth and the power of God's word. And so Paul begins with this belt of truth and the idea that we need to have an unswerving commitment, an unshakable conviction that we will know and live the truth. Now the second piece of the armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Paul says, stand firm, having fastened on the belt of truth and putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Now Roman soldiers would, would commonly have as a piece of their armor a, a sleeveless um, breastplate that would cover their torso. This would protect all of their vital organs in a battle. It was often made of leather or, or heavy material, oftentimes sewn with pieces of cloth or metal. Sometimes those who were wealthy would have one that was made of metal and actually fashioned to fit their torso and fit their body comfortably. Now, why would we need a breastplate and especially a breastplate of righteousness? Because Satan would tempt us to act immorally. We have temptations to act immorally every single day. They surround us, they swirl around us in this world all the time. We're commonly tempted to do things that we shouldn't do, to go places we shouldn't go, to watch things we shouldn't watch, to do things, say things, think things that we shouldn't think. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And Satan will tempt us he will tempt us to look at pornography. He will tempt us to cheat on our taxes. He will tempt us to lose our temper. He will tempt us to break a promise. He will make it seem exciting and daring to, to shoplift in the store or copy someone else's homework at school or sneak home office supplies from, from the office. And, and yet there is this temptation all around us to live an immoral, unrighteous life. And when Paul is talking about this breastplate of righteousness, he's talking about the everyday, day in and day out, practical righteousness that is lived in the power of Christ. Right? This doesn't mean a life of perfection. None of us are able to do that. But we've talked about through, through this study in Ephesians the fact that this is not by our own strength. 
that we live out the Christian life by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit within us, by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that he has equipped us to walk worthy of the calling that we've received. And so this breastplate of righteousness is that part of of everyday holy living that we're called to as a as a Christian. This is this is about having a commitment as a person to be a person of integrity and righteousness, to be committed to always doing the right thing, to doing the right thing in the little things, sometimes when it seems like it's no big deal, but but to even in the small things as well as the large things, to live without compromise, to have ourselves armed with the blessed breastplate of righteousness because Satan would tempt us to live an immoral life and it will destroy us. It will, it will destroy us from the inside out, attacking our vital organs. Number three, Paul uses this illustration and he says, you need to have your shoes on. Verse 15 says, shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Paul is, is talking about these shoes that Roman soldiers would wear. They were usually leather boots or sandals, and oftentimes they would have embedded uh, pieces of metal or, or rocks in the soles to give them extra traction on the battlefield, similar to football players or sports players wearing cleats on the field to give them more traction as they're running so they don't slip and fall, so they have stability in, in their stance when they're fighting. And, and this is what Paul is, is talking about. Shoes on our feet and ready for battle. A soldier would never go into the battlefield without his feet protected, without his shoes on. This was his foundation. This was what made him ready to enter the battlefield. Now, parents, maybe some of you can relate to this, but I can't count the number of times when we've been all ready to go somewhere and it's time to leave and we're trying to walk out the door and get into the, into the car and, and get out of the house so we can be on time and yet the kids cannot find their shoes. They're, they don't have their shoes on and, and we're looking for a missing shoe or we're looking for that pair of shoes that we need to have. And, and this is a common thing, right? Sometimes we're not prepared because we don't have our shoes. And, and this is the idea that Paul is talking about, that we need to be prepared that we need to have our shoes we need to have a preparedness and and listen to what he says about specifically about these shoes he says having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace now this is probably a reference to the prophet isaiah right this is a reference to isaiah 52 verse 7 and in isaiah 52 it says how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. This is an interesting idea because this this comes all the way from the idea of the ancient battlefield. You see, in in those times, moms and, and, and sisters and grandmothers would send the men and the boys off to battle but they didn't have CNN and Fox News and, and they didn't have 24-hour news cycles and they didn't have the internet. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have the reporting that we have. And so when they wanted news from the battle, there, it would have to come by form of, of a messenger who would come from the battlefield and would run from the battlefield to, to declare whether there had been a victory or whether there had been a defeat. In fact, a famous battle that many of you have probably heard of was the Battle of Marathon, where a man famously left the Battle of Marathon and ran 26 miles back home as fast as he could to tell about the results of the battle. That's why we run marathons today is a reference to this, because they would send a swift-footed soldier who would run home to give the news, good or bad, about the battle. And it was commonly held that when this soldier was running home, that, that the, the wives and the women and the old folks would be watching in the distance to see the runner coming to know what the news might be. And that they would be watching his gait and his stride and his steps on the path to see if it was good news or bad news. Because if it was bad news, you could almost tell by the way they would run. They would almost drag their feet. But you could see the energy and the excitement of a runner who was running in a victorious way to bring good news, right? And and the Apostle Paul here is saying, I want you to have your feet on. I I want you to be ready with the gospel of peace, the good news that God is coming to bring the ultimate victory. I want you to understand that that this is the excitement that you have in Christ. And, And so you come with your shoes on, ready in the readiness of 
the gospel. Number four, the, the next piece of the armor is the shield of faith. Now the soldiers would typically have two different kinds of shields that they would use. One was a smaller sort of rounded shield that was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It, it was small and agile and, and, and used more in, in an intimate, close setting when a soldier was fighting in a battle with other soldiers. But the other kind of shield that, that is referred to here it is a more of a broad shield. And this was a, a tall shield, probably four feet tall and over two feet wide. And, and with this shield, it, it was made of solid wood, several inches thick. And, and there would be iron straps or bands around this to keep it together to, to make it solid. Many times it would be covered with wood or, or covered uh, on the outside of the wood with leather that might have been soaked in water to, to give it uh, the power to extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. And as the Roman soldiers would advance, these soldiers would be at the front of the battle. And, and you might have seen this portrayed often in some movies where they would stand very close together so that nothing could penetrate and they would make a wall by, by putting these shields all together in a row. And as the other enemy would fire their arrows and flaming darts into the battlefield, they would, they would stop and, and stick these shields into the ground and stick these shields above their heads, making a covering and a wall that would extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy. And Paul says here, he says, in verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. I love that because the picture is that we have an enemy and he's launching at us flaming darts. He is trying to destroy us. He is, he is taking arrows dipped with tar, lighting them on fire and, and launching them into our lives. And these arrows can cause us to doubt the goodness of God. Paul says, I want you to take up the shield of faith. This is the, the belief and the trust that we have in who God is, in the goodness of God. And, and so often the enemy can tempt us to doubt that God really cares about us, to doubt that he loves us, to doubt that he is tenderly meeting our needs and watching over us, to doubt that he's working out all things for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, to doubt that, that he's going to make everything work out, to doubt that he has my best interest in mind. Have you ever wrestled with those doubts? I know I've wrestled with those doubts. Remember when Satan came into the Garden of Eden and he tempted Eve? And the temptation was, was really an attack on the goodness of God. The, the temptation was God is withholding something from you. God doesn't have your best in mind. God doesn't want you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he knows then you'll be just like him. And God is keeping something from you. And this is, this is the attack of the enemy and what he will try to do to us. And so in order to walk in faith, we need to have the shield of faith to remember the goodness of God and to extinguish the flaming darts of the enemy. We need to have faith that God is in control of all things. We need to have faith that he really cares for us, that he is working all things for our good. Faith that he has our best interest in mind. Faith that he is loving and good and he will always do what is right. I love Psalm 27 because as David writes the psalm, and you can go back and read it later, but so David is wrestling with some big questions in life, and, and he's struggling, and, and he's thinking about these big thoughts, like even if my father and mother forsake me, and he's really wrestling with these truths, but he comes to the end of this psalm, and he says this in Psalm 27, 13, and 14. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, he, he says almost to himself, right? Be strong and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. This is the idea of taking up the shield of faith. Like life may not be going well. There are flaming arrows coming my direction. All of my circumstances may not look perfect, but I'm trusting in the goodness of God. I've got the shield of faith. I know that God has my back. I, I know that no matter what, he will never leave me or forsake me. I know that he's working all things together for my good. The next piece of armor that Paul talks about is the helmet of salvation. He says, in all circumstances, verse 16, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, right? The, the head is one of the most 
important and vital areas that needs protection. It's why a soldier would always wear a helmet in battle. There, there were swords flying and arrows coming through the air and all kinds of dangers that could knock a, a soldier unconscious, that could render him helpless in the field of battle, that could take his life. And, and so often Satan does the same thing to attack us, to attack our beliefs and to attack our assurance of salvation. And that's why Paul says, take up the helmet of salvation. The enemy would seek to come and attack us to cause us to doubt God's goodness, to, to see and look at our own failures and sins and inadequacies and, and to forget that God really cares for us and loves us. One of Satan's most disturbing attacks is, is this attack on, on my, my assurance of salvation, this idea that, that I could lose my salvation, that what if God is displeased with me? I, I begin to look at my own performance, my own works, and, and I begin to evaluate my life and feel that I don't measure up. And, and, and the enemy comes as the accuser and begins to destroy and, and seek to, to tear down my faith. And, and it's in those moments that I need the shield or the helmet of salvation to remind myself of God's presence, God's power, God's promises, his truth, his willingness to take me home. You see, in this passage, Paul is writing to Christians. So he's not saying that we need to trust in Jesus for salvation. That's not what he's referring to in this moment. We've, we've already discussed what it means to trust and know Christ and to be saved. Paul is here referring to the fact that, that we've been saved, but in this moment, we need to take up the helmet of salvation to remind ourselves as believers in Jesus that he's going to carry that work of salvation all the way to its completion, right? We talked about the different aspects of salvation, the idea that we're justified or declared righteous when we trust in Christ, the idea that our whole life is a journey where we're walking in sanctification and we're growing to try to become more and more like Jesus Christ, but there are ups and there are downs. There are days when we, when we struggle and fall and there are days when we walk more victoriously. And then there's the final aspect of salvation in our glorification when we're transformed into the image of Jesus. And, and what Paul is referring to here is this aspect of glorification, that, that God is going to carry us through our life and to the final completion of our salvation in Jesus Christ. This is what it means when we're talking about the helmet of salvation. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul also speaks about this in, in chapter 5. He says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. This is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The hope that Jesus is going to carry us all the way to glory and complete the work of salvation that God has for us. Now, the last aspect of the armor is the sword. Right? This is often the favorite one because we, we love the idea of weapons. We love the idea of attacking, but a sword was actually used for both attacking offensively, but also for defending oneself against the attack of the enemy. And notice specifically what Paul writes about the sword. He says in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He says specifically that the sword is the Bible. It's the Word of God. It's God's truth. It's almost like full circle. We went from the belt of truth now to the sword of the Word of God. And listen to what Hebrews chapter 4 says in relation to this. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When we enter into the spiritual battle, when we're fighting for our lives, when we're fighting for truth, when we're fighting on the battlefield for our family, for our children, when we're fighting this spiritual battle that rages all around us, the best weapon that we have is the word of God. The best weapon that we have is the truth. Do you remember Jesus when he was tempted in the, in the desert? Satan came to him three different times with temptations, and, and each time, how did Jesus respond? He responded by quoting the words of Scripture back in the face of the enemy. And one question that I have to ask myself and, and wrestle with and, and even ask you is, 
If the enemy is attacking you and the battle is raging all around you, how much of God's word do you have hidden in your heart so that you can have a defense? Right? The, the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Right? This is my weapon in battle. And, and so many of us, our swords are dull and weak because we have not studied and, and learned and memorized the word of God. Un unfortunately, in our culture, this, is, this has become a thing of the past to memorize scripture and to, to meditate on the word of God. And, and yet, when we face the attack of the enemy... One of the most powerful things that we have is, is his truth. And, and so often we face those attacks. It's, it's not as simple as, well, let me find my phone or let me pull out a Bible and let me look up a verse. But so often if we have something already stored in our memory, something already in our heart, something that we can go to battle with when the enemy is, is tempting us, when the enemy is coming against us, that we can fight back with the truth of Scripture and say, I know the Word of God. And I can speak the word of God with authority and power and withstand the attack of the enemy. So we have this picture. Paul says, I'm going to use an illustration, right, from my everyday life. He's probably chained to a Roman soldier every day. And he says, look at these soldiers. I mean, if we as Christians would outfit ourselves in a similar way, not with the elements of war, but with the elements of faith, with the belt of truth. With, with the shield of faith, with the sword of the Spirit, with the helmet of salvation, if we would arm ourselves, we could be victorious and stand firm in the battle the way he has called us to. And then he closes this. I love this because it, it's almost like Paul says, you know, i got a little secret weapon. When you're going into battle, I want you to remember your secret weapon. He says in, in verse 18, he says, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, Paul says, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says at the close of this, he's just described all the armor of God and how we're to stand firm and put on the armor of God. And then he says, don't forget your secret weapon. It's prayer. Don't, don't forget to pray. He says praying at all times in the Spirit. Reminds me of 1 Thessalonians when Paul said to the people, pray without ceasing. This idea that, that we should have a spirit and a heart and an attitude of constant prayer with God. That, that in our everyday lives, as we're coming and going, as we're, as we're driving, we're praying. As we're thinking about our children, we're praying over them. As, as we're in school, we're praying, right? School might not be allowed anymore uh, technically in schools, but, but I think as long as there's tests, there's going to be prayer in schools. But, but for us to pray in, in, in our everyday life, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, to pray in those moments of temptation, to pray in those moments of doubt, to invite God to come into those moments with us, to lead us and to guide us. He says, to that end, keep alert. Paul says, when you're, when you're in a battle, you have to be alert. You have to have your head on a swivel. You have to be paying attention. The enemy could come at you from any different direction. And Paul says, you're in a spiritual battle. You need to be alert. You need to be aware and always praying. He says, making supplication for all the saints. That's a big word that we don't use very much anymore. But supplication is a simple word that just means a request. It means we're lifting up our brothers and sisters in prayer before Jesus. We're bringing their needs to the throne of God, that, that we're praying and, and we're lifting up our, our family members, our friends, and those people in our small group, those people that we do life with, we're praying for them. And this is a way that we minister to them and that we fight together side by side in this spiritual battle. Paul says, don't forget the most important aspect. Don't forget your secret weapon to pray. See, I'm convinced that if we really understood the spiritual battle that's raging around us, we would pray a lot more than we do. If the enemy lulls us into a place of complacency, a place of apathy, a place where everything in my life is fine, so I guess I don't need to pray. And, and so often we're immune or unaware of the raging battle that's all around us. But I'm convinced that if we really understood Satan's attack on our families and our children, we would pray a lot more 
than we scroll on social media. I'm convinced that if we understood Satan's attack on our marriage, that we would be on our knees praying, right, a lot more than we would be going out on dates to dinner and movies. I'm convinced that if we understood God's attack on our friends and the people that we really care about, that, that we would spend a, a lot more time imploring Jesus to protect them and to, to guard them, not, not just physically, but spiritually, that we would be praying and using our secret weapon in battle. We could do a whole message on the power of prayer and on how God uses that, but, but I think it's no accident that Paul wraps up this message on the battle on how we arm ourselves to fight this battle by saying, I want you to pray. Don't forget to pray. And Paul, even one of the greatest Christians to ever walk on the face of the earth, says, pray for me too. I need prayer. I'm trying to live out the purpose that God has placed me on this planet for. And I want you to pray for me that I have boldness in sharing the gospel. I love that. that He, he says, give me uh, power and boldness to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. I love that because Paul is chained in a prison. He doesn't say, pray for me that I get out of prison. He says, pray that God blesses my ministry and helps me to stay faithful. So there is a spiritual battle. It's raging all around us. We need to understand how to stand firm. It's by arming ourselves with the armor of God that he's given to us. We need to be intentional to arm ourselves with the word of God. I hope that maybe even this week you'll take some time to look at this passage again, to think through what it means to put on the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, to take up the sword of the Spirit, and that maybe you would challenge yourself to pray and ask God to lead you and guide you into these things. Church, thank you for watching this message with us. I want to close with a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Ephesians. Thank you for the way this book has challenged and encouraged us. Thank you for the way that, that Paul has shared with us life-changing truths and how we can walk them out in our in our day-to-day -day lives and god this message could not be more applicable because satan himself would seek to tempt us and to derail our faith and so often lord we are apathetic or unaware of the battle that rages all around us and yet it's real and so lord i pray that you would help us to be alert that you would help us to stand firm to arm ourselves with the, the tools that, that you have given to us so that we might be victorious in this spiritual battle, Lord, until you bring us home, until you win the ultimate battle. And so, Jesus, thank you that in the meantime we can trust and know that you've already won, that you are good, and we look to you and we love you. And Lord, I pray for the one person who may be watching who's never trusted in Jesus, and maybe this message has been an encouragement or a blessing, and I pray that that today would be the moment that they would reach out to you and trust you for eternal life, for salvation, because you want to come into our lives and transform us by your truth and guide us and shape us and mold us into your image. And so, Lord, um, give us wisdom and strength to walk in these truths, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, thank you for watching. God bless you. Remember, you are loved.